One of the poetic genres that we study in English departments is elegy, the lament for the dead. My colleague Max Kavich, who wrote a book on elegies, describes them as poems about being left behind. Many elegists through the centuries looked to the non-human world for solace. They sang of how the very trees and birds seemed to share in their loss. And they found consolation in the thought that cycles in nature would continue long after the death of the friend or the beloved or the self. But what would happen to elegy if the natural cycles and non-human beings that might otherwise console us were themselves what was lost? This is our predicament today. We know how to mourn the individual dead, but climate change presents us with the deaths of whole species and ways of life and prospects of justice. It confronts us with extinctions and transformations that aren't just past, but also ongoing and oncoming, a foreseeable future of loss. Most bafflingly, it asks us to reckon with ill effects that we have all helped in massively varying degrees to cause, and that are distributed as unevenly as wealth. Small wonder that the old ways of mourning often fail us. But so far, rather than invent new ones, an ecological requiem at every climate strike, most of us look away or go numb. I know I do. We may not be climate change deniers, but we're in denial nonetheless. In suggesting to you that our climate crisis urgently requires new grief ways, I mean to reject both cynicism and quietism. The quietist would tell us to accept the loss of biodiversity and habitability as beyond mourning. The cynic would dismiss these losses as beneath mourning. Instead, we should take our cue from the young climate activists around us who are on intimate terms with ecological grief. They know the weather inside their heads is entangled with the weather outside. They know we need to do more than one thing at a time, to mourn and to be organized, to strike because we know that we are stricken. Thank you.